everyone to the Visual Performing Arts as this post-secondary educational experience. And yay you for thinking about it now. Congratulations. So that's a head start is thinking about what you want to do now. And then coming to the people that have done something in the field, uh, quite a variety. I, you wait till you hear this is such a powerhouse panel. It makes me so happy that there's such a representation from visual performing arts on this panel. If you have any questions and you're afraid you're going to be too quiet, we have a microphone here that you can use. Wow, it's really tall. <laughs> and so, um, look at that. <laughs> and now it's my height. Okay. Um, and so if you would like to ask a question, if you want to come here, you're absolutely welcome to do that. And um, we're going to introduce first, Matt Copley is uh, from Marine City High School. He's now at University of Cincinnati at their Center for Creative Studies musical, for uh, music performance. And um, he's going to talk first because he sent his, he sent a video. He's in production right now, so he could not come up. So he's going to give us his little two cents worth here. So we're going to start with that. Hi, my name is Matthew Copley, and I graduated from Marine City High School in 2016 last year. And I'm currently attending the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory Music CCM for musical theater. And um, so arts education to me is very important. Throughout my whole high school career, I pretty much participated in everything I could in my drama or acting group, my theater group. Uh, I did a lot of things outside of school, such as working with the Riverbank and Snug Theaters downtown Marine City, um, networking with other people, and then during the last few months of my senior year of high school, I was fortunate enough to be able to work downtown Detroit at the City Theater with Mitch Album in his new show called Hockey Musical. And that as a whole experience, just, just that musical, really solidified my choice to major in musical theater. And the reason I'm saying all these things is because I wouldn't have been able to do anything without the education starting in middle school and following up through high school. And it started with Mr. Van Dyke at Marine City High School in seventh grade when I started choir, because that's the first year they offered it. And through choir, I found an outlet through singing. And I knew I really liked to sing, and I guess I was pretty okay at it. And, um, that's what I knew I wanted to do. It got me out of schoolwork, or it, got my, it cleared my head from schoolwork. It got me out of trouble, and or it kept me out of trouble. That's a better word. <laughs> and uh, music was really the one thing I really connected to in school. And so I knew I wanted to do something with music all throughout high school, and I knew that's what I wanted to do after. Um, and so I started with choir, and as soon as I got to Ninth grade, I started auditioning for Rainbow Dramas Productions. I was in A Christmas Carol my freshman year. As Jacob Marley, I was in Romeo and Juliet. And the arts program, the theater program in particular at Reed City, is extraordinary. Uh, from the pit band to the choral direction to the actual uh, stage direction by James McCullough, our drama director in high school. And everything they taught me, I brought to school. And CCM is ranked number is ranked in the top three in the nation for musical theater colleges. They have almost 100% signing rate after they uh, after they graduate, and each year about a thousand kids audition for the program just musical theater alone, and they accept about 20. And this year they accepted 18, and I was lucky enough to be one of the 18 people here right now. But uh, it wouldn't have been possible without the help of Mr. McCullough and the opportunities I was able to have in Marriott Drama. And throughout my whole life, Mr. Van Dyke and Mr. McCullough together really helped me, it really pushed me to do everything. I did honors choir in high school. I tried, uh, like I said, this time at Riverbank, and Mr. McCullough was very supportive of me trying new things, working with new people and directors, because my field is all about networking. And you really have to put yourself out there and not be afraid to audition for anything. Audition for everything you can. And failure is such a big part of the career path you're choosing, but failure itself, people shouldn't be afraid of in an arts field. Failure is something that strengthens everybody, and everyone needs to go through it. There'll be so many no's before there's one yes, and a lot of people just see the successes 
classes that I had throughout high school, but a lot of people don't know everything I've went through, failure ones. I don't know how many failures I've had because I'm not a <laughs> I don't share a lot of them. But uh, failure is very important in this ministry, and high school really, really helped me with the arts in high school to deal with failure and rejection and not getting the part I want or not getting the solo I want to wear or anything, or even getting an E on a test in history that you just really thought you knew. Even that little failure strengthens you for next time, and then you know what to work on to get better as an actor, singer, dancer, performer, student, athlete, whatever your forte is in life. And um, yeah, that's, that's really my story. That's why I'm here right now. I couldn't have done anything without the help at Marine City High School. Marine City High School has been a tremendous help, even with all the faculty, the principal, Ms. Akula, Mr. Mean, uh, Mrs. Shunk, everyone has helped me get to where I am today, and I couldn't be more grateful for that. So I thank you and Marine City High School and everyone in St. Clair County to, uh, I thank you for letting me pursue my dreams and giving me the right education to be in one of the top universities in the nation for musical theater. So thank you so much, and I hope this was helpful. Thanks, man. And, um, I should have done that. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Kim Shunk, and I'm coordinating this awesome panel. Um, and I just want to say, when I was growing up, uh, I was one of those artsy kids that dabbled in a little bit of everything. And my dad said, you know, are you going to do anything with art? And I said, Dad, I can't. I'm, not, I'm too moody. I can't. I'm not going to be able to eat if I, if I do that. I'm not going to be able to make money because I, I don't think that I would work hard enough or consistently enough in order to make a living at it. And so I've been able to supplement um, what I do with a little bit of art here and there, but it's not a focal point for me like it is for these guys. And everything that, uh, everything that you do adds to who you are and what you do and your craft, you know? So all the experiences that you have are really helpful. Matt talked a lot about failure and networking. Those were the two big takeaways that I had from what he just said, other than he had a great supporting environment as he was growing up. And, uh, but failures, I think, are really important. And this panel has done a lot, um, and I'm sure that they each have a failure that meant something to them and moved them forward, okay? We can't be afraid of those. We can't be afraid of those, I call them learning opportunities. <laughs> you pick up and go on. You know, it happens, you learn from that, you move on. Networking is very, very important. So I'm going to have the panel introduce themselves and maybe talk about one significant failure or one significant experience in networking that you really thought moved you in the right direction, that was very motivating for you, okay? All right, we'll start on this end. Mr. Troy? Hi, I'm Chris Troy. Um, I currently work here at Reese as a video producer, but that's only one of the things. I also run my own film video company, film company called Foundation Productions. I'm also a musician, and I'm also a studio engineer down at a number of Detroit studios helping out down there. I thank God every day for failure. And I'll tell you why, because failure allowed me to learn, and it, it allowed me to look at the bigger picture. When I first graduated from high school, I was a Marisol grad, I wanted to go into technical theater. That was gonna be my thing. I love set design, I love lighting, I love the whole thing. Well, in the process of doing that, I kind of discovered along the way this wacky thing called rock and roll. And to pay the bills while I was going to school, I started becoming a sound engineer at some bars over at Eastern Michigan University, just working with some small bands. Because I was better at that than I was doing the theater stuff, I inadvertently became a sound engineer. And, and then, long story, long story, because I kept my opportunities, and I call them opportunities, because every day you experience something, you learn something. And I ended up, after being on, I was on the road for a number of years, tour, touring with a sound company, doing some pretty major acts. I got tired of being on the road, so I took a job at the Troy Public Schools to be their theater manager, their technical director, and their auditoriums. Um, in 2000, also, next to in Troy, they had a video program, and they had some pretty nice video gear that I used to go over and talk to the kids, and I was like, this is really cool. Tell me about the Final Cut Pro, was what they were using at the time. And working with the kids, I, I opened myself up to learning a new skill. 
In 2010, when everything was going crazy, I was laid off from Troy Public Schools. I didn't have a job. So here I am, a theater manager without a degree. I came here to Risa um, to do some theater work for Marysville getting a new place open. And all of a sudden they found out, oh, you know something about video? And I started working in the video program and working with more full-time, more full-time. And now I produce a program called Moment in History that's been really successful with an Emmy nomination. Um, a program that's helped educate a lot of the schools, have used my short videos on local history, which later on, while doing theater, and looking into experimenting and finding research on set designs, wallpaper, I fell in love with the Victorian era. And doing that meant then I was learning research on all different kinds of things, which now my wife and I live in St. Clair in a beautifully restored Victorian home. I found a love for history. So all those mistakes and all those failures along the way made me who I am today. And because of those, I have a really great position here at RISA doing something that I really love. Um, kind of quiet, so I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm Brent. I kind of class my, classify myself as a maker. I went to Grand Valley to get a BFA in ceramics. I would agree with everyone in that failure is almost a necessity as an artist because um, you really need to learn that everything that you try is not gonna it's not gonna work out. Uh, you have to learn. You have to kind of critique yourself and figure out what worked, what didn't work, and take that knowledge and build on it for next time. Um, we did a lot of projects, and being in clay is is any number of things can go wrong and a lot of times you think you make a really killer piece and you put it in the kiln and it turns out a really bad color or it explodes or you know any number of things but you just kind of have to let it go and um, <clears throat> just appreciate what you did and how you got there and just do it again. Um, my professor always told me make more but you know that's all you can do. You just got to keep going and, and keep working. Where can people find your work right now? Uh, right now, I display a lot of stuff in Grand Rapids. Um, like I said, I went to school at Grand Valley, which is close to Grand Rapids. Uh, some of my friends have a shop, and I'm also speaking with a couple of shops in Green City to uh, set up a piece, consignment deal. And you have some things online as well? Yep, yeah, I do have some things online. Um, if you just look up Brent Westrick on Instagram, add me, you know, ask me questions, pick my brain. Um, I take pictures of the stuff I make and, and, you know, feel free. I'm always open to talk to future artists or artists currently. A long time ago, when you were at SC4, um, you worked with Laura Hayes, who was a counselor at St. Clair High School in an art class. And you, I don't know if it was you or Brian, one of the two, asked what I like. And she told you that I wanted a culinary that would, had stars and moons and cut out of the culinary. The culinary, you know, the big thing that strains spaghetti, blah, blah. Well, I have it, I still have it today. It's on my counter and it will be for life. The culinary with stars and moons cut out, you know, they did it, they made that for me. It was awesome, you know? And yeah, I love it, it's still on, it, it, I mean, how many years ago was that? Yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah, and it's been on my counter since then. Yeah. And it works, and it goes in the dishwasher, and it's uh, safe. Yeah, it's awesome. It's nice to be able to, as a maker, share things <coughs> with everybody, and it's it's kind of a unique gift to be able to share that enjoyment with other people. Yeah. Very cool. Martha? Your turn. Yeah. And um, if you have questions too, by the way, please ask while they're you know raise your hand. Don't do what I do and be rude. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Uh, my name is Lori Hannon. Um, I'm currently teaching uh, art at St. Clair Middle School. I went to, uh, I started at Western Michigan University, um, and as probably a lot of you might be in the situation, you kind of know you want to go to college, but you have really no idea what you want to major in. That was me. I was kind of like Kim growing up. I was always interested in, you know, doing art and artsy kind of things, but I really didn't consider it uh, as a major right away. 
I honestly can't even tell you why I picked my first major, which was occupational therapy. But I just remember my first year at college taking all these science classes and hating them, not doing well in them. But I did luckily have um, just an intro to art that I had to take as an elective. And I just remember having a conversation with the professor and I was telling him I wasn't doing good in my science classes and you know, I was loving my art. And he's like, have you ever considered you know, being an art teacher? I'm like, no, not until this one. And also, you know, you never know who's just a little quick comment by somebody to inspire you, to kind of tell you, you know, this is a possibility. You know, it really makes a big difference. So, you know, after that I switched um, my major and I realized that uh, at the time Wayne State University had a really good art education program. So I ended up, um, you know, transferring there and getting my, uh, my degree in, in teaching art. So I've been teaching, uh, I got hired to teach art at, um, in, way back in 1990. I uh, started in elementary, you know, there are bumps in the road sometimes where, you know, they had some cutbacks at the school and I got transferred out of art and I had to teach my minor, which is social studies for a long time. But in the meantime, I, you know, I still kept my finger in the art world with uh, teaching at St. Clair Art Association. They have art classes up there. You know, I started, a, you know, teaching Saturday art classes there. Um, I have a potter friend who um, does pottery on the side, and I was helping her do stuff. So, you know, even when I wasn't doing it full time, I still kind of there's lots of different opportunities that you can um, um, kind of keep your fingers wet in it. Um, I'm currently helping illustrate a children's book uh, for a friend who wrote a book. So there's there's lots of different things that you can do um, if you have an interest in the arts. There's just there's not necessarily one particular thing. Uh, so if you love art, there's lots of different ways you can do it. How did your how did the friend who asked you to illustrate for him or her how did that person connect with you? Well, we had a speaker come to St. Clair Middle School a few years ago, and she was a teacher who had just uh, wrote a children's book and was on bullying. And so she came to the school and presented her book. And afterwards, um, I said to her that, you know, I'd, I'd like to, because since she was a teacher, and she mentioned in her little presentation that the art teacher at her school was illustrated her book for her. And so um, the, the girl that wrote the book that I'm working with is a teacher at St. Clair Middle School. So, you know, we kind of heard that, that it was a teacher and the art teacher who had made this book that, you know, we could do that too. Yeah. So uh, she had already written her story, um, but she was just at the beginning stages. So we decided that, you know, we could tackle this, so we're we're close to finishing. So it's, cool. a, it's a process. But yeah. So and Lori stuff too. You can see around town, St. Clair, that big fish that's on the river. Yeah. Was One of your, your class I was a the, That's part of the. Um, I'm on also part of the St. Clair Public uh, Art Committee too. So I'm on the board of the St. Clair Art Association, and um, a subset of that is the Public Art Committee. So we do lots of different, you know, trying to bring art to the community different ways as we can. Yeah. So. All right. Very cool. Jesse. Uh, Jesse White, Master Gunsmith at Marine City Gunsmith. Um, I believe the original question was name one significant failure. Yeah. Uh, it propelled you in the right direction. Yeah. Well, it propelled me in this direction. So. <laughs> uh, by 1988, I had been at CCS for a year and a half. Um, studying fine art and I ran out of the internal discipline you need to make that 12 credits you know a semester work um, it's tough it is very tough if you're gonna go into graphic arts uh, you're gonna work just as hard as if you were going into science or anything else um, my fallback was to join the military and it was a 180 degree shift from where I was headed uh, it was not a popular choice with a lot of people in my family, and it was something that I had to think about for years before I finally uh, 
but I intended to squeeze the trigger on that. Um, it was what I needed, though, and uh, it was a good opportunity to save money and get my act together so that when I got back into the real world, I could maybe be creative again. I didn't do that until 2004 when I went off to gunsmithing school, but combining all the other things I'd done in the meantime, that was the, the focus of uh, everything I'd studied prior to that. Um, and it uh, has turned out to be a, a good combination of all the things that I like to do. Um, it is perhaps uh, not the best route for everyone. You go into the military, you will find the internal motivation you need uh, in the first two weeks. If you don't, you'll be back to what you were doing before that, so don't worry, it's not a permanent commitment. They will wash you out if you're not cut for it. Uh, but it doesn't have to be the scary thing that you might be afraid of that, you know, that it is. It's a good way to turn yourself around. It's a good way to save up some money. Uh, you can turn it into a college education, but what they don't tell you is that you have to re-enlist to do that and save every last penny you make. Uh, so it's not for everyone. I would, I would strongly recommend you not do it unless, uh, unless you wanted that scene for four years. Uh, point being, um, if you do fail early on in your endeavors here, you don't have to give up entirely. Step back, take, take a deep breath, and go back into it. Uh, you have no idea where it's leading. So bottom line, don't just do nothing. Uh, keep swinging. You don't, you don't ever know where it's going to wind up. You also have uh, some local civic responsibilities. What do you do locally? Uh, since moving in to Marine City in 2006, I have uh, been on the Chamber of Commerce board more than once. Uh, stood in as interim president for about six months. I've been on the city commission. Uh, Reinstituted a VFW post in Marine City. Um, been in every parade since 2006. Uh, uh, could really go on and on. And, and guess where I found it for the first time? Painting fish on ceramic cups, <laughs> yeah. which I have in my bathroom, in my kitchen, on my desk at school. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my girlfriend's a potter, and thank God for Facebook because old people like us can turn it around. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Drew. Cool. Um, so my name is Drew Schultz. I'm a drummer and a producer and a songwriter and a uh, instructor as well as a recruitment representative at the Detroit Institute of Music Education. Um, I've been very fortunate um, in being kind of tunnel vision focused on working with my heroes in the music business and their names are maybe more to our parents than to some of the students here in the, the room but I've been very fortunate to work with people like Aretha Franklin and the Four Tops and the Temptations and um, the Funk Brothers, a lot of Motown artists, which is what led me to Detroit. Uh, and Kim had asked about failure. And one of the hardest times I found myself in was after being picked up out of college to go on the road with the Four Tops and Temptations, I stayed with them for about three and a half years and then had to make the decision to go back to school and finish my degree or to stay on the road. And I chose to go back and get my college degree. And one of the biggest things I failed to do was to stay in touch and to keep myself out there with them enough to, to come back and join back with them. Because uh, the intent was to go back and get my degree and then join back up with the guys on the road. Um, and that led me to not get that job back, uh, which was a very difficult time for me because I was thrust into the harsh realization that um, that success can be fleeting when it's large scale success. That you get done with those opportunities and while they're on your resume, it's more about what you do with that resume moving forward than what you've done so far. Um, and what Jesse just said about keep on swinging, I, I was lucky to have someone tell me that, that 
Uh, any baseball fans in here before I keep going? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Couple. Yeah. Anybody know the name Babe Ruth at least? <laughs> awesome. Lots of people saying yes. We all know Babe Ruth had one of the uh, home run records of all time. But we don't necessarily realize that he also had one of the strikeout records of all time. Uh, which means that, that Babe Ruth was swinging at everything that possibly came his way as hard as he could. Um, and I took that to heart. And it, it really uh, led me to any, any crack open in any door that I wanted to pursue, I would stick my foot in there, go say hi, network, go meet people. Uh, and it's led me to kind of land on my feet in a big way and be able to continue working with the Four Tops, the Temptations, Aretha, not on the road necessarily, but just this last summer they had um, Four Tops had a residency at the Pistons halftime show. I was doing all the track production for them to sing along with the Palace. Through that I got to work with CeeLo Green. Um, uh, some other opportunities have come up that may not have even happened for me if I was on the road um, in different capacities that I did not see myself in 10 years ago when I was just really tunnel vision on being a drummer and a musician. Um, and so, just like Jesse said, you never know where it's going to lead. And sometimes you're in that in-between moment where you may be, um, you know, like Lori said, you may be in between high school and college, not quite sure where you're going to go, and you may be worried about that. Or you might be in between college and a job, not quite sure where you're going to land. But you just got to have faith that you're going to land somewhere and keep on swinging. Um, so I really love what Jesse said there about failure and about just keep pushing. Correct. Yeah, I, I went to get my degree in jazz performance. Okay. Yeah. yeah, which is not what I loved, by the way. I, I like jazz, but I don't want to be a jazz drummer full time. Uh, but when I was going to school, there was not something like Dime that did degrees in pop music. Um, and so I had to choose between orchestral music or jazz. And in order to keep playing drums, I chose jazz. Now he's at Dime. Dime's very cool. You need to check it out. <laughs> if you're a musician, you need to Yeah, talk to me afterwards if you're a musician considering music. I'm glad to chat with you. Yeah. I, I love, we had Drew come to the high school to talk to our kids about him, and there was a drum kit. And he brought a drum kit, and the minute you put him, you see that? There it is. There's that face. That's such a smile. The minute you put him behind a drum kit, he just lights up. And it just made me so happy to watch him do that. It's like, oh, watch him. You know? And it's a beautiful thing. Um, and it's a beautiful thing for you guys to be able to do what you want, to follow your passion, and to be smart about it, okay? And one of the, um, that, there's a statement from John Legend that sticks in my mind right now, when, you know, he was turned down by a couple record labels, and they said no to him. And he took it as no for now, mm -hmm. you know? Didn't take it as a permanent no, it wasn't a rejection, which is what these guys are saying. And the Babe Ruth swing, awesome. Awesome, just keep sure. swinging at it, whatever it is that you want to do. Casey. Okay, hi, I'm Casey Schonk. Um, that's my mom. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm a student, I'm a senior at the University of Michigan. I'm studying dance, and I have a minor in business administration. Um, I'm also a student athlete on the University of Michigan's dance team. Um, yeah, and failure, huh? Um, so when I was three, maybe, uh, my first dance teacher, I started dancing when I was about that big. <laughs> um, I was, well, maybe a little bigger. I was like two when I started dancing, and my first dance teacher told me, you'll never be a dancer, you don't have a good turnout in your hips. And I was like, heartbroken, because I was like this itty bitty kid wanting to be a dancer. And um, so I'm gonna prove that person wrong for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and some other things have come up along the way, like when I got to college and I, I didn't just want to dance because I was thinking like, uh, I don't know, like dancers make no money, there's no way I'm going to be able to live and be a dancer, so what else can I do? So I thought, alright, I'll be an architect. Um, and I thought that was creative, I like to draw, let's do it. So I took one architecture class, um, didn't sleep for three days trying to finish a project, I was going crazy because I was too much of a perfectionist for it. and I. I don't know, it was nuts. I was drawing for so many hours on coffee and five hour energy and then I was like, nope, I want to sleep sometimes, this isn't for me. Um, and then I was like, okay, I'll be an engineer because I don't know, math, I don't, I like math. Um, so I took a lot of engineering classes for 
yeah, I took Calc 1, Calc 2, Physics, and I was like, this is really hard. Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, and then I found business, and it just kind of supplements my dancing. It's something that I can do, and I know I can apply to anything um, while I'm dancing, and I know now that I'm going to dance in the future, and even if it's not dancing physically, I'll be choreographing. Dance will be in my life in some way. Um, and I think those failures and, well, I, they're not necessarily failures, but those things that have popped up have led me to believe that I can make dance a career. And jo oh, thank you. Joey, maybe a failure, but maybe something that failed you. Yeah, a bit of that. Um, so I was an acting and musical theater major at Oakland University for the past two years. I graduated from Rain City High School along with Matt. Um, I mean, we've acted together since we were 10. Thanks to his mom who started such a great theater group for young kids to learn. Without that, Marine City and St. Clair, they wouldn't have had such strong programs in the past six, seven years. So I was really grateful and thankful for that. And um, I had a great high school career. Um, I started doing stuff at the Snug, Snug in Riverbank Theater. Um, Kathy Burton, she asked me for the first show. She's like, do you want to do this? And I'm like, yes. So um, I started doing stuff there. And um, then I went to Oakland. It was a bit of a shell shock. Um, if there's any regret that I do have, it's that I didn't do enough research into what, what college felt like home for me. If you don't go to the college and check it out, you will never know how it truly and really feels. I was told by their administration that I was not professional enough, even though I was getting jobs. And so I was faced with the decision, it's either a pay 20 more grand for the next two years to be at a place that I didn't like or follow my dream. Um, so I left Oakland and I was like, why am I doing this? I, I should just be doing something else. And then I asked myself, why do I want to do this? I went and I saw Beauty and the Beast. And I remember how much I loved Disney. When I was five years old, I wrote, I wanted to be Peter Pan, but then my, <laughs> my kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Reed said, no, I can't be that. So I wrote, I want to be an actor. And I didn't discover that until I was um, a senior in high school. And to me, that's just so empowering because even when I was five, I knew what I wanted. Now that's a big promise to keep up. So every day I started listening and reading to self-help books. I started working out. I started just manifesting everything I ever wanted. I auditioned for Disney twice. I did not get in. I barely made it past the first round. And then, my friend, who is down there right now, Megan Shook, she was a dance major at Oakland. She was like, hey, why don't you audition for the Disney College program? Sure, why not? I got the first interview. I was one of the first people to be notified I was in, and then I was the first one in my audition. Out of 60,000 people, I was one out of 90 people to get a job at Disney as a character performer. I didn't give up. Basically, what I remembered, what I told myself every day is that if, there's no, if there is no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. And if I would have thought that Oakland was my biggest failure and I would have just given it up right then, then I would have never been who I am and where I am now. Because it's not much the destination, it's who you become along the way to get where you want to go. I'm stronger now than I've ever been. And I'm so proud, and I'm sorry if I'm choking up. <laughs> but um, basically, if I go to 100 auditions and I get told 99 times no, but on that 100th try, I get told yes, is that success? Now, if you go to like a famous Hollywood actor, he'd be like, no. But it doesn't matter. Um, I got that one shot and I'm taking it. It'll fuel him for the next 99 auditions, too. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, it's tough Very to go good. after that. <laughs> um, my name is Lisa Steinborn. I work here at RISA. Um, I started out as a graphic designer. I've moved into more communications and marketing. Um, you know, as I was listening to everyone, it occurred to me that Failures, I don't want to say it's a daily thing because that sounds pretty dire, but it's something you, you deal with 
on a regular basis. And it's part of what we do as creative people. You have to really learn how to deal with those little failures that happen along the way. I don't know that I point to one thing in particular that was kind of a watershed moment for me, but uh, my first job out of college was, oh, entry level graphic design for a small business. And I was laid off from that job after a short amount of time. And then, you know, if that hadn't happened, I would have moved into the job I had after that. And I wouldn't be in this job. So you're going to deal with failure all the time. And, and it, failure sounds so negative. I don't mean it as a bad thing. So you just have to learn to really look at that as critique. And, and kind of maybe adjust what you're doing. Yeah, and working with people, so your job really is to, somebody says, I have this idea, and I want this, and it's your job to make that happen, and you don't know what's in their head. I, I, I oftentimes I think what I really do is problem solve. Yeah. And it's, it's, you have someone come to you with a challenge or an idea in their head, and Sometimes what you really have to do is maybe persuade them that what they thought they needed or wanted or, or were expecting is maybe not the best solution. So a lot of what I do is problem solving. Yeah. So I, I always liked art when I was little. Um, I was very fortunate to have teachers in middle school and high school and college that encouraged me and kind of pushed me to figure out how I could take my love of art and I'm, my geeky love of grammar and marry them <laughs> together into a job. So I, 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 I'm fortunate to have found a good fit for me. And you too went to CCS? I did. I went to SC4 for two years uh -huh. and transferred to CCS. And I was very stubborn. I just, that was the only college I, I applied to because that's where I wanted to go. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not the best way to do it, but that, that, I just knew that's where I wanted to go. Because I went and I visited and I had this moment where I was like, oh my, this is where I belong. Yeah. This is where I should be. So it was, it was a great, great place to work. I loved it. I yeah. loved it. Um, I'm Tom Kepar, and I'm the uh, Director of uh, Recruitment and uh, Career and Testing Services at SC4 Now, which is a very long title. Um, <clears throat> they had to give me two business cards to hold it all on. Um, but before I was doing that, which started this summer, I spent uh, eight years uh, as an adjunct instructor uh, teaching theater. I have a, a couple of my former students are here, which is awesome. And uh, I've also appeared on stage with Joey. Um, he actually uh, was my son-in-law, so we're actually <laughs> technically related. Um, it's a great relationship. That, uh, of course, that goes along with the nine wives I've had in various different plays, too. So it's, I think I must be some that probably arrested for polygamy, which would be probably a failure in itself. But um, I have failed in a lot of things, because uh, I went to Central Michigan University. Um, and I, I ended up signing uh, nine different majors. Uh, I was a member of the uh, Major of the Month Club. Oh. Um, they would just mail me a new one and I would start doing that one. Um, and then when I had my graduation audit, they kind of looked at me and they said, you have to finish one of these, you know that, right? Okay, okay. Um, which one do I have the most credits in? And clearly it was theater, right? Because that's, no, it was geography. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure how I ended up where I am sometimes. Uh, but I, I did do some theater at CMU, but I didn't take it very seriously at that point. And it wasn't until many years later that I started um, auditioning again. And I was going down into the Detroit area. And I was sitting in a green, green room um, you know, where they have you wait to, before you can come out and do your audition. And how many of you are uh, familiar with uh, a chorus line, the musical? Yes. And there's the one song with the, the they're all trying, uh, you know, I hope I get it. Yeah. Um, and they're all trying to guess what the director is going to want. You know, do they, does he want 
people who are tall? Does he want them to do something fast, something slow? They're all trying to second guess that. And I would sit in these rooms with these other actors and everybody was trying to second guess what the director was going to be wanting. And we did that, I did that for like seven or eight or 10 or 15 or 30 different auditions. And I got a couple of bit parts, but mostly I was not getting anything at all. But there was this one guy who kept getting all these parts. And he would sit in the green room with us, but he would kind of sit off by himself. And he would not participate in this gossip about what the director might want or might not want. So finally one day, realizing that he probably was getting a part in this play again, I went over and I sat and I said, why don't you, know, why don't you ever talk about this? He says, I don't care what the director wants. I learned that a while ago. He said, I'm going to go out and do what I want to do. And either he or she is going to hate me and not hire me, in which case I wouldn't have wanted to work with them anyway. Or they're going to love me and they're going to hire me. And that was amazing <coughs> to me because I realized, and I say this to my students, my actors a lot, I always tell them when they're nervous about going to audition, I say, what do you have when you walk into that audition? Nothing. You don't have a job. You don't have anything at that point. What if you walk out and they don't give you the part? Well, then all you lost was a little bit of time and you've gained some experience. And so when you, when you look at it like, I don't have anything to lose, I'm just going to be the artist or the maker or the actor or whatever it is that I, that I can be, and hopefully they like it and hopefully they don't, or hopefully uh, you know, they like it, and if they don't, well, that's fine too. Um, it was liberating, it was inspiring, and not just as an actor, not just as a performer, um, but in everyday life too, because sometimes we are so cautious, we are so, and you, you know, you can't walk around just telling people everything that's on your mind because that's really antisocial. But sometimes we need to take that leap. We need to be ourselves. We need to present who we are as a, as an artist, as a performer. And so that's what I've tried to do for the eight years that I was teaching at SC4 was try to uh, connect that, you know, for my students as well. That because they would always they would come to me and they'd say, "What are you going to be looking for in this in this production?" And I'd go, "Well, I'll be honest. I always have an idea who the who could who of you could be. I'd be lying if I hadn't pictured a cast. But what I really wanted was somebody to come in and do something amazing and make me go, "All right, the whole that plans out the window." That, if I put her there, now what do I do? So that, that to me was, you know, that, that um, failure was really altered by watching somebody who he had failed too. And he had figured that out, but uh, realizing that, that there were, really weren't any risks involved there. Especially because, you know, none of us were making enough, enough money doing those particular parts that it wasn't going to be life or death anyway, so, yeah. That's awesome. What, what a lesson to be the biggest and the best you you can be and let that work for you. And there's, so, from this whole panel, Eastern, Grand Valley, Wayne and Western, uh, college, or er, I'm CCS and Pennsylvania School of Gunsmithing, New York University, um, University of Michigan, Oakland University and Disney College program, CCS, and Central. Central. From all these schools and all these different perspectives, everybody learned from things that might have been, uh, that could have been negative, that somebody could have said, that's it, I'm done. But they didn't. They all took that no for now and learned from it. And they're here, and they're awesome. Do you have questions? Because I have a million. So if you don't start asking questions, I'm going to. So what do you have? What are you thinking? Go. What exactly is the Disney College program? Um, what the Disney College program is, um, it's actually very little uh, um, unknown. But what it is is that um, you basically apply online. You have to be at least enrolled in college at the time that you do it for at least a semester. And um, you can pick roles that they have. Um, 60,000 kids apply a year. 
from that, only 30,000 get a web-based interview. From that, it's cut in half, 15,000 only get a phone interview. And then from there, they pick 5,000 from all their different roles. And then character performer is 90. And what you can do at Disney, um, you could be part of vacation planning, you could be um, doing rides, you could be um, a waiter there at Disney World, you could do anything at Disney World. Um, they also offer classes while you're down there. Um, for entertainment, they offer acting, singing, and dancing workshops. Um, I mean, they also offer business classes. Um, it can count as college credit depending on the college that you're going to. Um, yeah, um, the Disney College program is awesome. Uh, yeah, so if you're ever if you ever wanted to work at Disney World, that's a way to get your foot in the door, and then from there you can either extend your program or you can be offered a full time contract. Joey, where would they look up? Where would they find something like that? Information about that program? Literally type in Disney College program okay. on Google, and um, it'll send you right to the site. You will learn when applications drop, um, the requirements. It's it's awesome. I promise you. Cool. Oh, and you get to live on site on Disney. They give you housing, um, and you work for them, and it's really, really exciting. And you get to eat Mickey Mouse pancakes? I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so do you do that in between going to class? Like, so you go to class at... You can, it's, kind of like it's, it's kind of like an internship. It's kind of like an internship and that. Like, my program, it lasts for um, eight months. So I go from January till August, but... In my mind, um, I know with my passion that I could get offered a full-time contract, God willing. Um, yeah, just last about eight months, um, there's a fall and there is a spring program. And yeah, I think applications will be dropping for the next in January. Um, can you talk a little bit about the audition process since you're here? The audition process for Disney. Um, they all kind of vary, like literally every day I watched a different um, person, um, a video on them going to an audition and telling me about their process. Um, it usually consists in three rounds. The first round you go in, you do simple dance movement like a jazz square and you march because they want to see if you can just march in a parade. Okay, from there they're like, okay, you can move and then they do a cut. Um, I've been in a, an audition where there was 105 and that was one where I got selected for my contract. And I've been at some where there's 400. Um, for guys, it's easier. Um, there's about, on average, 90% are girls, so there's about five to 20 guys. Um, and then in the second round, they give you a harder dance. Um, it's usually about a minute in length, and it just goes to show like where are, are you on the scale from zero dance to no dance. But that's not what sells you on the job. What sells you on the job is your animation. So they'll like give you a circumstance. Like mine was, um, ooh, we're gonna do a Halloween theme. So imagine that you're a Disney villain for 30 seconds, and like it was crazy. Uh, I I forgot what I was. So I did that, um, and then for the next 30 seconds, you're the monster that you created. And so we did that. Um, then after that, um, they do a really big cut, and then the third round is where they give you um, scripts to read, and they can also videotape you, they can also give you measurements, and sometimes they bring in um, people who are characters at Disney, well, I shouldn't say are characters, they're friends with characters at Disney, and then they'll talk to you and you can get hired on the spot like that. So it's, yeah, it's a rigorous process with Disney, but they let you know right away. absolutely love auditioning. Um, some people don't, but I just, I think it's the best chance to like show what I can do. Um, and I like pressure. So, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know, that's kind of weird. Um, just my ballet teacher last uh, week told me when I came into audition, she said, you weren't auditioning for us, you were auditioning us to see if we were a good fit for you. And I didn't really realize that until she said that, but it's so true. I went in there to see if the program was going to fit me. I didn't, I really didn't care whether or not I was like going to be good enough for them. I was just going to show them what I could do and do the best that I could do um, on that day. And it worked out. I liked them and they liked me. So, yeah. 
But yeah, I just feel this. I just think are a great chance to show what you can prove, um, show your training, and the best way to do that is to be prepared. Um, do How everything. Do what? How do you be prepared for an audition? Um, do your research. Know know what they're looking for. But I mean, not like not like he was saying. Um, like study the what the director's going to want, but just I, get a feel for um, who the people are that are in the program that you're looking at. If it's what you want to do, if the people are somewhat like you, or if you could see yourself there, um, it's a good idea to, to know what you're getting into before you get there. Um, and just know that you have all the materials that they're going to ask for, from you. Like for me, they asked for um, a three to five minute solo um, that was choreographed by me. and. Um, then there were like some modern and ballet classes that they had us take and they watched. Um, but I knew that I was as prepared as I could be going into and so all I had to do was perform and do what I knew how to do. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, no, no, no. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, I'll be super quick. Um, <laughs> my my opinion on auditioning falls, falls really in line with what Tom said earlier. Um, and it's, it's different for a school than it is for a professional opportunity. What Tom said earlier definitely stands for professional opportunities where they know what they're looking for. And you can't read their mind unless everything is laid out there exactly bullet pointed what they're looking for. You can't totally know. So if you're going in as an actor, if you're going in as a dancer, as a musician, for an audition where you don't have hard guidelines, showcase your strengths. Go in there and shamelessly show them what you do well, because if those skills fit what they need, they will want you to work for them. Um, and if they don't, what Tom said about not enjoying working with them is probably going to be the case. Um, so for professional opportunities where you don't have those those black and white, this is what we need. Uh, just go in there and, and find the best way to showcase what you do well in the short in the short amount of time you have. For college auditions, as someone for Dime who actually oversees auditions, because that's one of the things I do for Dime a lot is, I am the person who is auditioning students. I will tell you right now that, that college auditions tend to be very structured. They will show you exactly what they want from you, they will tell you we want this much repertoire of this type of variety, uh, showcasing these different skills, and you have this long to do it. Um, my recommendation to students who are planning on auditioning for five, six, seven different schools, get the audition material all in one place. Print it out and have it on a table. And look at them and say, okay, where do all of these fall in line? Because what you might see is you can prepare some of the same repertoire for bunch of different colleges and instead of having to worry about seven different auditions you can worry about two different pieces that will apply to seven different schools and then you're you're doing the extra work for whatever they specifically ask for that doesn't align with the other audition requirements so look at those auditions all in one place and compare and contrast them and get ready for them in as uh, efficient a way as possible uh, the other one is really read it through. Read through the fine print of the audition materials because sometimes you'll get thrown for a loop if they say, oh, we want you to sing major and minor scales in two octaves going up and down. And, and you know, sometimes you talk to someone on the phone uh, and to be blunt, I'm guilty of this sometimes because you're just talking to someone. Someone says, what's the audition like? And the person on the other line, in this case me, I might say, oh, well, we have you perform two songs. We have you, so I read a piece of music, we test you on scales and chords and melody. Well, that doesn't tell you what scales. It doesn't tell you how we're testing on melody. But I'll tell you what, our audition material lays it out pretty straightforward. And most college audition programs will as well. Because um, <coughs> unless it's one of the most competitive schools out there, unless it's something like Joey's saying where they only take a tiny fraction of people, those schools, they want students. You know, they want people. To, they want to help you. That's what they're there for. They want to teach you. They don't. They don't want to tell you you can't do it. They want to show you how to do it. 
So don't be too nervous because they're there to help you. They're a school that's there to develop your talent. Um, but yeah, that's my, that's that's awesome. my two cents. That you, you brought up a really good point when you said that um, you know they're there to teach you. So when you're auditioning for something, this is really important to know. Be humble. You know, be good, be confident, but be humble. They're there to teach you, and they want to know that they have something to teach you. Yeah. Don't act like you know everything. Yeah. I mean, I, as again, as someone who does the auditions myself, we don't look for perfection. We look for potential. Does that make sense? Yeah. So don't stress over every little thing, because if you already can sing anything that's thrown at you, you can sight read any piece of music, you're an unbelievable, perfect singer, you don't need to go to school for vocals. You know what I mean? We're all here to learn and the school's there as a tool for you to learn. Um, so don't worry about being perfect. Just worry about showing them that you have the potential. One quick point um, that you remind me of. Uh, if you can avoid being a stranger on audition day, that's great too. Um, if you can kind of network your way in before you get there, uh, it feels better. <laughs> First of all, because you're in, you're in the space with someone maybe you've already had contact with. Um, or go visit the school early, kind of just get your foot in the door before you get there. So it's not so, ah, I'm at an audition, scary place. Well, I use Gabby as an example. So Gabby, did you go to the presentation in the band room when Drew was there? Or no? Okay, so now this is her first time seeing somebody who may audition well. She wasn't there, I mean, she was younger. So now, as a junior, she sees this Drew guy, and maybe that's somebody I'm going to audition for, and you have a face now to go with the name. Really, really important. When those um, college uh, advisors come to your school to talk to you about the colleges that they're uh, representing, that's your contact with that university. That's your first in. That's your first, I know this person. And that's your start, you know? And they'll send you in the right direction, okay? So make those associations. Be the person who goes up and shakes the hand of that person who nobody else is talking to because they're from a university and I really wanna to go to this one. I don't wanna to talk to them because they make me really nervous. No, you go up and introduce yourself. What do you have to lose? You only have something to gain. Make that contact. Yeah, we okay. do wanna to talk to you. That's why Drew yeah. and I come out to schools, you know? Is we wanna make those contacts, so. You had a question. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Um, actually, I have like six. <laughs> so one. Um, I uh, was an arts major in Germany, so um, I ended up working in automotive for a uh, thankfully short period of time. And uh, I'd like to hear from Jesse White on the, the push and pull between the arts world and sort of the world of concrete things. Like, uh, one thing I noticed about having been an artist and being in art school is that I was more creative when I was oppressed by something I didn't really care for, which is a really strange thing because I hear a lot of you guys talking about having one foot in the arts and maybe one foot in the educational world or mm -hmm. one foot in the production world. So there's kind of this practical world and this, you know, in my opinion, magical world of arts. So I'm just curious because your, your experience is very kind of black and white. That is a tough one. Um, if you're going to be a, a fine artist, as it were, um, how you're going to go about getting a job doing that when you get out of school, that's up to you. I can't advise anybody on that one. Um, if you're in graphic arts, you have a way better chance of actually getting a job. Um, having said that, there's all kinds of people that have made it coming from both directions, but uh, I wound up in manufacturing for financial reasons. Uh, you know, you're not going to own a boat two cars and a house as a sculptor right out of college. Um, I know sculptors who do, only a few. One just passed away, so, uh, you know, not to put a cloud over you. Uh, at 49 years old, I can still feel a, a weird pull between uh, my, my artistic ambitions and the need to make my mortgage payment. Uh, it's not to say you're not going to find success there. I think you will if you find that one little corner that you can fit yourself into and combine everything you'd like to do. And 
I would take a wild guess that everybody in the room is not very linear. I'm sure you have seven or eight things that you like to do. Uh, if you have a hobby, or two or three or five, expand on those. Don't put those in a closet and forget about them because you think that they don't apply to what you're going to do. Uh, I knew a fellow in California that had an awesome job uh, writing code. Uh, this would have been back in 1993, so there was barely an internet at that time. In fact, there wasn't in 93. Anyway, he claimed to get his job and be successful because he had an English degree and therefore could prove to his employer that he knew how to communicate. It worked for him. Uh, not, nothing very artistic about that, but point being, where the hell did an English degree come in to a guy who works on a computer all day long? But that's what got him settled in. You've got something else going on besides what you think you're focused on right now. Uh, take a second look at it because that might be the thing right there. Uh, you know, looking back, uh, would I do anything differently and try to stay in school and get out with a four-year degree and do something with that? I don't know. Honestly, uh, I think I had a pretty damn good time over the last 20 odd years. <laughs> been in every job description you can think of, and it's not because I can't hold down a job. Uh, again, the need to pay the bills, you know, that, that didn't jive well with being an artist. Now that I'm older, and I've kind of returned to the art field, uh, it really feels like the right thing to do. So I'm going to keep doing what I do seasonally, you know, with the gunsmithing here. Uh, but in the off-season, I'm going to push back into the art field, and I'm not going to off of it, but I'll be a lot happier in here because there's always been that one little place that wasn't back in art school and was you know going to the machine shop for 12 hours a day. So back to where I started. It feels good. Can, can I jump in? You got oh, it first. No, I've already okay. talked. You, got you know, it. he brings up a good point about too about hobbies and about your interest, and I'll say in your passion too, because I learned something the hard way, and that was. I loved music so much. I loved playing music. I loved, loved writing music. So when I got the opportunity to go out on tour for a number of years, the thing I found out was when I got off tour, the last thing I did was pick up my guitar because the last thing I wanted to see or hear was music. It was one of those things where it was just my job became, it was part of my hobby, but it, it became such a, I don't want to say negative thing, but it was just, you know, I, I often joke around with people. I've been around the world three times, and all I've seen is airports and arenas. <laughs> and it's one of those things. It's, 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 it's load in at 7 o'clock in the morning. It's load out at 1 o'clock in the morning. It's try to get some sleep on a bus to do it all over again the next day. And, you know, for anybody who knows me or anything, the bands I'm usually involved with are usually pretty loud. And I like that energy. I like that. But when I get off the road, all I wanted was quiet. Because that was the only time I could get my kind of my my head back to get ready to do it again, and that was one thing. When I quit touring, I kind of I rediscovered my love for music. So just be aware of that. That is, if, if you have a passion, there's a passion, and then there's he's right. You got to pay your bills, and a lot of times I find the the clash a little bit here at work where I, I could go way off on a tangent. I think Lisa could con you know, comment to that with dealing. Her office used to be next to mine, and I was, stuff was always loud or whatever, and it was just like this, you know. The anxiety of trying to be artistic and trying to be creative, sometimes it's not about painting a Mona Lisa. Sometimes it's about, as she said, dealing with a client and making them happy. So I started Foundation Productions for the same reason. What I can't do here at work to be incredibly creative I can do on my own, and that's my hobby. And so there's, there's a, always try to find a way to separate that, like he said, he's got the gunsmith. He, he'll do that, that's his job. His passion's over here. Those two things can come together and merge, in and out and in and out, and that's what makes it awesome. Um, but, but just be prepared for that, that sometimes think something you think you really want when you get there, be versatile enough to say, okay, how can I adapt this with life?
workshop on I'm not sure what I want to do, or hey, I'm a junior, now what? Um, and we will work through some of that. And so you'll find that some of the things that um, you're really interested in are complete opposites. And what are you going to do with that? You know? And so we'll look at how to marry those. Like, Casey loves math, but she's a dancer. No, she loves math and she's a dancer. Okay? So what can you do to put those things together? Jesse probably can't draw a fish on guns. <laughs> we could. Well, now that you've mentioned it, I okay. <laughs> <laughs> never good thing about his fish. Wait a minute. I love his fish. I, I have them all over. Um, but yeah, the, you know, sometimes you have to pay the bills. There's this guy back here in the back of the room who pays the bills from Ford Motor Company, but every single day he works at his craft, which is singing and playing guitar. Okay? And he plays all over the place very, very passionate about it, that is it, okay? That's that's where his heart is. And if he didn't have the opportunity to do that every day, going to court would be a heck of a lot rougher. Yeah. <laughs> See, and that was kind of my point, is yeah. your, your interest and your love can also be your stress relief. For sure. And can be your, yes. your safety valve. For me, all of a sudden, my safety valve became part of the problem. Yeah. Which is just something that, you know, we're yeah. here to try to give you advice. Some of it's not going to be that good, you know. <laughs> not trying to bum anybody out, but it's just it's the reality of things. It's it's tough going into a creative field. You know, my when I when I said to my parents, I want to go study theater. They, now this was a few years ago. I'm amazed. I'm amazed now by you parents who are so much more supportive of your kids and and want to enrich their lives and give them the support. My parents were like, "You're doing what?" Well, you're going to pay for it. I, I had a minor in chemistry just because I, I promised my mom I would have something to fall back on, which actually I worked for Detroit Edison for a couple years and learned thermography and all that. So it was kind of in my interest, but it was that little safety valve. I have a lot of friends in the arts who say, I feel like if I have a safety vent, then I'm, I'm cheating myself. That's for them. Not just fine arts, but I did as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. What did your portfolio look like at CCS? Okay, well, <laughs> that was before computers. But um, I, my advice is work on your portfolio. Work really hard. Make it as diverse as you can. Um, show as many different aspects of your ability as you can, and have have a professional preview it with you and help you pare it down and decide what you're going to include in it and just really my my senior year I had a portfolio class so that when I graduated I would have a really strong resume and a really strong portfolio to go start interviewing with so I also had to present one for college for CCS for admissions you have to go through it um, an interview process so make it as strong as you can. I, I worked with one of my professors and just refined it until I was really confident. And sometimes on the school's websites you can find what they are looking for, right Sid? And uh, did you find that of all the schools that you've looked at? I know what CCS wants. They only want eight of your best pieces. I'm not sure for Rhode Island yet. Okay, so. so check there first. Check with anybody. Um, admissions. Admissions is a great place to check because they want you. And so call them first and they'll send you in the right direction. You know, If they can't answer your questions, they will send you in the right direction so you can get those questions answered. My question was for Lisa. Um, now you're going, you went through SC4. Yes. And now you went to the College for Creative Studies. Right? Yeah. Okay. My daughter's love is both art and her computers. You know, and she's combined the two and works on animation, that type of thing. Um, what would you recommend for her as her first thing? Uh, I've recommended to go to SC4 for her, for her first two years, and then after that, apply for it. Um. I, I would meet with um, somebody, I, I would meet with SC4, 
I, I was first generation, I was first generation to go to college in my family, so my parents were very supportive, but a lot of it I had to figure out on my own because they had not been through that process. Uh, my dad's big question was, when I said, I want to go to art school, he said, can you make a living doing it? And I said, I think so, and he said, then go for it. But he wanted to know I could obviously support myself. He didn't want me to come back home and move in after college, but one of the, one of the hiccups I had along the way is I, I earned my associates at SE4. I was under the understanding that all of my credits would transfer. They all transferred. They didn't all meet CCS requirements, so I ended up having to go three years to get my bachelor's, so I wish I'd known that up front. So I would explore that with SE4 and CCS and, and make sure it's going to transfer because you you don't want to have to go any longer at CCS than you have. And I, uh, if I can add, just because we that's something we, we work with a lot, uh, not just I mean with any school, but we have been working with CCS to try to get a, a better articulation agreement with them so that they will accept. Um, our classes um, a little more on a one-to-one -one basis because as Lisa said um, everything will transfer sometimes it's not helpful right? so then they won't take it it's not that they're going I won't take your credits just it does no good for them to put it on the transfer schools um, transfer and we do the same thing you know if somebody comes in to SC4 we don't put everything on there um, we only put the classes on your transcript that are going to help you toward what you're now trying to do um, so we are trying to do that. The problem with um, with any of the arts, though, is that um, if you're if you're going into uh, science, technology, engineering, the STEM, uh, mathematics, um, we we generally all agree that one plus one equals two, and that you know uh, how to measure the angles and those kinds of things and that if you put this chemical in this beaker with this other chemical there's going to be an explosion you know we we agree on these things and so we don't do those things you know um, art is very different you know I mean and it, and it kind of goes in with what I was saying before that um, you do have to do the research you have to know what you're getting into but you have no way of knowing how the audience is going to react, how the director, how the person you're auditioning for, how the other artists you're working with, how they're going to react. And so what we run into a problem here sometimes is that schools will say, we have a particular way we want to teach this subject, art, and we don't think you're teaching it the way we want it taught. And so even though you've done this portfolio, you've done a lot of really great work, it's just not the same in their their mind. Um, I used to run into the problem with my acting class. Uh, if you went to CMU, you were going to get credit for acting one and acting two. Your next class was acting three. They accepted it. If you went to Western, they would take give you six credits in theater general credit. But you were going to start over and take acting one and acting two because we didn't teach it the way they wanted it taught. So that's a, that's a tough argument. Because it's like, well, it's the same thing. Well, I think it is, but they go, no, it isn't, and that's an artistic judgment. It becomes really kind of tough. So we really do need to have those kind of agreements in advance, and it's been it's been a struggle with CCS. Can I add to that a little bit, just real quick? Um, because I went to SC4 and I got my macro agreement, and I transferred to Grand Valley. And I transferred to Central, and then I went back to Grand Valley. Um, I lost a lot of credits from SC4 when I went to Grand Valley because they put them in like a, a general credit. You know, they didn't count. A lot of art classes were not to Grand Valley standards, so some I had to retake. Uh, some I did not get any credit for, and it went to just I had three extra credits of just Gen Ed. Um, so. Even though I had checked with SC4 that they would transfer to Grand Valley, when I got to Grand Valley, they said no. Um, so you really want to talk to SC4, and obviously they're trying to improve that relation with schools, um, but also have a game plan and see where you want to transfer, if you're going to transfer, and just kind of 
play, um, go between them and, you know, figure out the correct path, what works, what's going to save you time, money, and uh, just set you up for success. Yeah. I would say look at the giving and receiving ends. You know, look at uh, the school that you intend to transfer to. You know, make sure that you talk to them. Make sure that you talk to the school that you're coming from. Yeah. And, yes. yeah, and know, know that as yeah. soon as you can. Yeah. Uh, because to be fair, we sometimes also won't take credit from you know from another school. Sure. I mean, we have, because it's all about the faculty looking at that. They go, no, that's not the same thing. And most of the time, most four-year schools will have equivalency guides. I used to work at another four-year school, and we would have guides that told you exactly what to take at the community college that would transfer directly to that. So talk to again both both schools, giving and receiving. Technology has changed that so much in the past couple of years. Um, it used to be, uh, we, I brought this specifically to talk about networking okay. because uh, I've got a CD and a business card. It used to be, take this, check it out, whether it's for a professional opportunity or educational, that's a portfolio. Nowadays, a lot of times, it's SoundCloud, it's YouTube, um, uh, it's, it's in the digital realm. And so you can upload videos of yourself and have pretty good quality uh, as far as just the sound quality in the video with minimal investment and create an, an endless portfolio just by investing that initial money in the equipment to record it. Because it doesn't cost anything to put another video up on YouTube, another song up on SoundCloud or, or whatever platform it may be. Um, and so building a portfolio is is easier for a musician than it probably ever has been in the past if you want someone to be able to look at it remotely. Um, I do think that that for educational portfolios, versatility can be key. Um, for example, I know for our drum program, we ask students to play through multiple different styles of, of drum patterns. Um, and uh, and so displaying at least that level of versatility of basic building blocks is, is a huge part of that. Um, and so when building a portfolio, you might want to actually actively have it be diverse. Um, and record yourself playing a genre of music that you're kind of iffy on, but just to show them that you kind of can do it, and put it lower on the list. Don't put it as the first thing they'll see. <laughs> you know, but include it in there. what the portfolio is for. Um, and so, for example, on Sunday, I'm getting one stationary camera and one guy with a mobile camera to record a double angle, nicely shot video of a band that I direct to submit to consideration for festivals and for um, kind of what I call built-in audience opportunities um, in Michigan and the surrounding states. Because... They want to see a flashy couple minute video of not five full songs, but maybe five songs patched together where they see the, the versatility of the band itself. And for that type of portfolio, you don't want to send them a half an hour recording of an entire show because the people who are screening those submissions don't have time to look at that for every band. And that goes for arts too, I'm sure. And so you want just the highlights, just a little something flashy that catches their eye because they're just looking at that. Um, so, can I ask you what what opportunity you're you're asking for that needs a portfolio? Just for college, for his performance one day, I don't even know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, most colleges will ask for um, if it's not an in-person audition, they'll ask for a video. Um, and a lot of times, it can just be turn your laptop camera on and play, turn your cell phone camera on and play. Uh, especially for academic institutions, they are going to be flexible in understanding what the technology you have because not every student can afford to fly to London and record at Abbey Road. You know what I mean? Um, and, and, and so it's unrealistic to, to feel the, the 
pressure to record in like a really professional environment, pay an hourly rate is going to stress you out at a professional recording studio. Um, I would say the same exact thing that, that Tom said. Call the admissions department. Just just ask. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't you might have said that. Because they'll, they'll tell you. But I can say that um, hypothetically, if I was running a school and we were taking video submissions, I could not expect everyone to be able to afford to, to buy a crazy camera and great audio equipment. But let me say, on this panel, down on the end there, Mr. Troy does happen to have a company that does that. You might want to talk and to you him. Know, and here's another, when I was in Troy, I would always have students come up to me and say, Mr. Troy, can you take a few minutes after school and record me playing a couple flute places or piano pieces in the theater or in the music room? I'm sure you have great band teachers and maybe, you know, theater managers or whatever the schools you're at um, who would probably be more than happy to, to use the school's equipment or whatever, which is usually a little bit better. And I'm sure you get auditions all the time where it's like if you're in a rehearsal room or something, you know. Um, there, there's, there's probably lots of people at your school in the music part of the program who would be happy to help you with that too. Yeah. Will it do you well also to keep track of like honors bands that you're in and pieces that you played during them or is that a waste oh, yeah. of time? To yeah. Track You'll be surprised how many times you can apply a piece that you've already played in another outlet to an audition for a college program. Absolutely. Uh, and that goes for monologues for actors who may be in the room, actors and actresses monologues you've learned or um, or like Lisa was saying, the, the artwork that you've already done throughout your career so far. Um, it's not always necessarily uh, go into a situation and give them something brand new that you've learned just now for the audition. Um, you know, they, they want to see you at your best. And your best might be playing something that you've already played a million times in a, in a band program. But, again, make sure you ask those questions for the audition criteria because if they just say send us two pieces then yeah you can definitely do that but if they say send us two pieces selected from these ten that's a different animal um, so it all depends on the school and, yeah. and you know Drew also brought up a point worth auditioning is in a lot of cases finding out what the schools want because you know I would record a kid and I would really want it to sound great and and they'd be like, well, the school says no reverb, no this. They want to hear a dry recording of your performance. Yeah. They don't want to hear stuff tweaked in the studio to yeah. make it sound better than you are. They would rather have, like you said, an iPhone. Okay, here, I'm going to go ahead and play. They would rather have that than some Abbey Road recorded studio where they're like, am I hearing, is this the musician auditioning or is it the technician auditioning? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, um, I did an audition for a... Um, for a guy named Andrew Strong in New York, who was the lead singer in the movie, the, uh, the movie about the like, Scottish soul band, I can't remember what it was called. Um, and, uh, the Commitments. The Commitments, thank you. Yeah, it was Andrew Strong from The Commitments. And uh, they, they wanted a video, they specifically said it had to be one shot, no professional audio recording. Because when you have multiple camera angles and multiple microphones, you can do multiple takes. Say, oh, I messed up that section. Oh, I'll just splice in that same section from a different time I did it to make it look like all one performance. And so they specifically said it has to be one full take. Um, no, that you know exactly what he's saying. The technology can make it easy to, to you know, you can auto tune these days. Yeah. You know? Casey, you had some experiences where you had to do the same one single take. <coughs> was Netherlands, was Netherlands that? Was. and um, in their feedback after I didn't get that audition, um, I didn't get my ears. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they, they it, I auditioned for Netherlands Dance Theater, which is in the Netherlands, and so they had a full video submission, it's like a 10 minute video, it was like ballet, like basically a full ballet class and a solo, um, and I recorded it with my computer because I didn't have technology to do it otherwise at the time, and um, their feedback was, uh, you should have used better quality recording. I was kind of shocked by that, but so I mean, yeah, no find out what they want. Yeah, but they did want the single take because, whoops, I messed up that turn. Let me fix it with this other take. Yeah. <laughs> I was just 
experience um, if you ever became the president of the uh, major of the most um, Yeah, I, I, I ended up owning the company. <laughs> I'm not, I wasn't just a, uh, a client, I, you know, or not just the president, I was a client. You were the founder? I was, I was the founder of that. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm in. To, um, you can you can make a living doing professional stuff in Michigan, whether it's theater, theater management. Um, there are many companies. Go to EncoreMichigan.com. They have a list of everything that's in the area. Like it's it just depends um, on what you want. As for actors, um, there are some opportunities, but um, when you start to get into theater and film, there's unions. Um, one of them is Actors Equity. Um, that's the unionization of actors. Basically, um, you are protected, you get health care, you get everything. But um, once you go equity, you can't go back. You can only do those stuff, and that goes for a uh, designer, an artist, it goes for anybody. Um, same with SAG. Once you go SAG, you can't do anything else. So it, it's growing, but yet it's, it's not expanding as much as it could. Um, Marine City, I mean, it has its own little economy, so the Snug and Riverbank really anchored a lot of stuff there. But as far as um, the whole scope of Michigan, there can be so much more. But um, anywhere you go, if you want to find it, you will find it. Are you talking about, too, from a maker's perspective, like um, uh, uh, art as, uh, like Brent makes, you know, he may work with wood or he may work with ceramics or he may paint something or, or be requisition to do something, or Lori, same. Are you talking about that as well? Right, so we have Etsy now, we have uh, Amazon, we have all these outlets that just did not exist you know, several years ago. And so it seems to me like it's more possible to live in a place like Michigan, which for my entire childhood seemed like a depressed economy. But you know, essentially, Michigan has incredible assets that I never knew about before I moved here. So I see the arts technology combining to enable people to live where they are sure. and be able to make a living in the arts, whether you're uploading information to SoundCloud or you have a YouTube channel or you are selling through Etsy. So that's, I guess, kind of more what, what I was referring to. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to jump in on this because it's not t t quite cracked, but I, I went to New York for years and years. Um, and at first, I loved it. I loved the energy, but I was a student. I had dorm housing. I was, I, it was not the most realistic representation of what life in New York City was actually going to be like once I was done with school. Um, and it was great, uh, but I had the ability to kind of just do what I wanted to do because I was in school at the time. And when I came to Michigan, uh, when I got picked up to go on tour, the stipulation was I had to live in Detroit because the four tops specifically all live here. They still live in Detroit. And it was way less expensive for them to bust me out of Detroit than fly me out of New York. And so I spent those years on the road here in Detroit and got to know the art scene here and got to have a taste of working with the exact artists who I wanted to work with doing the exact type of art I wanted to do because I wanted to play soul and art these. And when I went back to New York to finish my college degree afterwards, I stuck around for another year and a half. Um, about, and I was living in a apartment in Brooklyn that's about the size of this table. Um, <laughs> and rent was astronomical. And in order to make ends barely meet, I was working behind the desk at a guitar school in Manhattan. I was working behind the desk booking session time and engineering at a recording studio in Midtown Manhattan. I was teaching at the Brooklyn satellite of that same guitar school. I was teaching at a school in Staten Island, and I was writing for Modern Drummer Magazine, 
and doing freelance work for other bands while trying to lead my own project and write my own songs. And in 2013, I got the opportunity to come back to Detroit for one show to do a gig with uh, the Funk Brothers, and which they're they're my heroes. They're the guys who made me want to play music, and it was just life affirming. And I went back to New York and just got back into that grind and found myself just kind of depressed because um, uh, Brent said something in the office before we came out here, he said that he likes to call himself a maker because sometimes it's just craft, not necessarily the art. And in music, it's the same way. It's, it's, it's the arts and the crafts. So you can have the most personal, expressive thing that means the most to you as an artist, or you can make a 30-second country jingle about Hackett's Pizza and it can pay your rent for three months. And one, and, and you want to be able to have both. And in New York, I had all the crafts. I was making ends meet as a freelance musician, but I did not have the artistic outlet to do what I loved, and it was driving me crazy. And so I came back to Detroit and found a lot of what you're talking about, that the scene is here, that there are opportunities here, and that in many cases, those opportunities pay the same in Michigan as they would in New York. But that $200, $300 gig that you get in Detroit goes a lot further than it goes in New York. And so, you can break out and get lucky in New York because the industry hub is there. The big wigs are there. But you can also break out from Alabama, like the Alabama Shakes did. You can break out from anywhere because of platforms like the, that the internet provide. And so the opportunities are still there. The competition is vastly increased because anybody can put their art up anywhere of any type of art, you know, in anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. So the competition is huge, but the opportunity is there, and the opportunity is international now, because someone can contract Brent to do pottery from Singapore, online, or whatever, fill in the blank. It's the, the internet art scene has opened up the world to itself, which increases opportunity and increases competition. But i found that if you want to be a freelance and you want to just do the craft, you may love a city like New York or LA. If you're consumed with the art, give yourself the time to cultivate that before you move to one of those cities, or you might find yourself in my position where I was just going nuts. You know, there's always that, in, in the late 80s, we'll probably say there's always that mentality of, I gotta go to New York, I gotta go to California to be discovered. And I've got friends who work for labels and stuff who say, you know what, if you're worth finding, we'll find you. If, 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 no matter where you're at, no, and, and you write about the YouTube and all the platforms that are out there, there's people that that's all they do for labels in performance-wise, is they sit and they watch YouTube videos all day. Oh my God, you should check this out. You should check this out. Um, the whole social networking thing has changed the whole world in performance. And you know, my, my wife makes soap, and she sells that. It's, she's got stuff going on all over the place. You know, just because it's it, it's not like a big thing, but she's just I'm like, where's that one going? Oh, it's going out to L.A. Right? It's going out the, you know. Um, <coughs> it, that has always stuck in my head, though, as far as performance or anything goes. If you're worth finding, you'll be found. That's funny that you mentioned that the soap. I I made soap for a while too, and my biggest client was a bed and breakfast in Green Lake, Wisconsin. <laughs> and I, I couldn't feed them enough. I, I finally had to find somebody who could do it on a much grander scale because I couldn't keep up with them. They wanted my little angel soaps, it was the angel in, and they wanted my little angel soaps or a red dragonfly with um, uh, in every room in the bed and breakfast so those are turning over every day. I can't do that. I just make cute soap in my kitchen. You know? And so I couldn't do it. I couldn't keep up. But yeah, so you can find those little niche opportunities, you know, and harbor them, you know? It's uh, it, a lot of my colleagues, and hopefully some of this starts to change, but uh, who are teaching theater, there are a lot of them who uh, I would look at their, and I know this because I would look at their syllabi for their classes. And 
they would be teaching an acting class, and six weeks of it was on how to get your head, you know, how to get a headshot, and how to do your resume, and how to. And I'm like, what does that have to do with teaching the actual acting? Um, and then, of course, their advice was, you know, when you're done with this, you have to go to New York, you have to go to L.A., you just have to. And that makes no economic sense whatsoever because that, if everybody else is going there, that's where all the competition is. As was said, that, that could happen anywhere. And frankly, it offended me because uh, to me, I think, you know, Marine City deserves art and Marysville deserves art and um, New Baltimore deserves art, Port Huron deserves art, all kinds of art, theater. And, and if all of the artists are being told that in order to make a living at this, they have to go to one of the two coasts, you know, that really bothers me. Uh, because and, and so it, it pleases me that Marine City has, you know, these two theaters going, and now Port Huron has a new one with the Citadel, and um, and that Detroit, uh, you know, Joey mentioned the EncoreMichigan.com. The fact that there can be a website that is sustaining itself based on theater in Michigan, uh, ten years ago, no way in the world, but now it is starting to thrive, and so it, there are opportunities to stay here or to attract some of the folks from other parts of the country to come here as well. So the opportunities are here. Okay, Mom's got to say something. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was uh, just going to say, I, I know that it's, we're already past our time. And yeah. I the artists would maybe want to stick around and answer some other questions. But before we go, I do want to mention we do have biographies of everyone up here. Um, on the table over there, there's also some scholarship information. Scholarships are over here. Yeah, there's some cool ones. You guys need to look at yes. arts and writing in Michigan. Um, so if you want to make an editorial cartoon, if you want to design jewelry, yeah. there's scholarships for that. Uh, so definitely look into that. And I, I am Megan with Blue Water College Access Network, so I, I help to organize some things. But I just want to thank our panel. I mean, we have some incredible people here, and they've done an amazing job, and I'm so glad that they were able to join us. So thank you very much for being here. More questions? If you have questions, bring questions. Ask Lori a question. Yeah. She hasn't talked at all yeah. tonight. Yes, <laughs> Come on, Lori. She's got her hands in everything. You did my intro. She's, I know, but like as a local artist, this girl has her hands in everything. And she keeps her head above water. <laughs> so beautifully. It's like, you know, it's just like she's just such a, a she's my source of calm. It's like, oh, glory time is a calm thing. It's a good thing. But doing so much, it's amazing to me. Yeah. So, yeah, if you have any questions, but uh, so scholarships, there are copies of those scholarships here. If you want to look at them, the, the colored copies are over there, the originals. So you can look at those. Make sure you write down those addresses, if nothing else, or take a copy here. Artandwriting.org. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. And thank all of you for coming out. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.